In the last couple of videos, we introduced circular motion by looking at the different properties of circular motion. So linear velocity versus angular velocity, as well as centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. Now, all of these different properties are connected and related to each other using some mathematical relationships and equations that we went over in the last video. And all the examples that we looked at we're pretty much uh, just looking at those properties. But today we're going to place those examples of circular motion within an environment um, that has gravity that we have to deal with some other forces at play. Because today we're gonna look at vertical circular motion um, with both tension and in the next video with surfaces. So to start us off, uh, let's just remind ourselves of the different uh, equations and variables that are at play in this particular unit. Uh, as a reminder, we are taking a brief detour into topic six. Uh, IB physics has most of the motion and forces stuff in topic two, but then topic six is all circular motion stuff. We're going to do it all with the same um, conversation here. So in your data booklet, you're going to find this in topic six rather than topic two. And these are the equations that we have. Let's define these variables. V is the linear velocity. If you see meters per second, this is talking about linear velocity, how much ground you cover in a certain amount of time. Um, omega, this curly W, is the angular velocity that is measured in radians per second. So it's really talking about how much of the circle is swept per second. Um, R is your radius in meters. T, capital T, is the period. Um, there's one equation here that's presented that has a capital T. Remember, the period is the time that it takes to do one full rotation or one full cycle of that circular motion. A is the centripetal acceleration, and F is the centripetal force. Now, note in these equations, these aren't labeled with anything special like A sub C or, a sub, or F sub C to represent that it's centripetal, um, but you should note that these equations are in the circular motion um, section. So these equations are talking about the acceleration and the force governing circular motion. All right, let's start by talking about uh, spinning something over the top of your head uh, in a horizontal circle. If you swing a ball on a string above your head and the string breaks, what happens? Uh, it'll be helpful here to see a top view. This is just squash because you're looking at it from the side. Um, so say we break the string at a given moment here. Once the string is broken, there's no longer a force center ward, uh, and you're going to see that ball continue on in a straight line, uh, tangent to the circle. So wherever it's moving at that point in time is going to keep moving. We talked in the last video about horses on a carousel, um, that are facing in the tangent direction this ball is just going to continue off in that direction because an inward facing force is required for circular motion. If that string is no longer there, there is nothing causing the curve to happen. Um, it is tempting to say like, oh, this is going to continue kind of curving, uh, but it's not going to remember its curve. Once that string is gone, its inertia will just take it in a straight line path. Uh, also, it's not going to go outward because uh, there is no force necessarily pulling it out. Uh, just uh, it's going to continue on the direction it's facing. But if we turn this and now instead of going horizontally over the top of our head, we're spinning it vertically. So up and down here. Um, now the string, if we are keeping a constant velocity on this ball or relatively constant, the string is going to be more likely to break in one location than others. Uh, so just take a moment to predict A, B, C, D, E, or F which of these positions, if this is moving clockwise, um, is our string most likely to break? Now, you might have experience trying to do this um, if you're trying to swing something uh, kind of in this circular path. And you might notice when you do that, that at the bottom, it tugs a little bit harder. C is the place that is most likely to break. And the reason is gravity is a thing here. So. Um, gravity is pulling downward, which means when you get to C, you are also counteracting gravity. So not only do you need a force to go in a circle um, that's po pointing centerward, it is now opposite gravity. So it has to pull even harder to make that circle happen. So today we're going to talk about what do those forces look like and how can we calculate them. 
centripetal force, the force that we've been talking about, can be calculated. Um, so we use that mv squared over r or m omega squared r. Um, we'll calculate the centripetal force. Now, the way that we deal with centripetal force uh, with a particular problem and drawing it on a free body diagram is a little different. This isn't necessarily a force that's showing up on the free body diagram. It's not a force that's acting on the object as like an individual thing, like the force of gravity is a force acting directly on the object or a normal reaction force or friction or tension force. Instead, um, centripetal force is more like the overall force that's happening to cause this circular motion. So centripetal force is what you get when you add together all of the other forces. Now we gave this a name before, we called this the net force. So when an object is in circular motion, net force and circular or centripetal force are exactly the same thing. Um, it's just another way of defining it. If we're going to say, no, this net force is always a centerward net force causing it to move in a circle. So we'll call it centripetal force, but they are equal. So whichever one you're more comfortable with, you can use when you talk about it. Um, now a vertical circle here, uh, will always have a centripetal force facing centerward. But remember, this is not some magical force. The centripetal force isn't necessarily the string. Um, it is a combination of the string and other forces that if you add them all together and get the net force, what you end up with is a centripetal force. So overall, this force has to be facing towards the center because that's the direction of the acceleration. And again, net force and centripetal force are equivalent if we're gonna be defining it in that way. So that means that there are a couple scenarios that you should be able to draw a free body diagram for and calculate these other forces um, that provide this overall centripetal force. So the most two important, the two most important locations for you to be able to calculate for are the top and bottom, um, because these are the ones that are perfectly in line with the gravity. So they're going to be our extremes. Um, so let's look at these examples and figure out what the free body diagram looks like. Now at the top, we have a centripetal force uh, that has to be pointing downward because that's where the center of the circle is. Um, so at the top, we're going to draw this centripetal force just downward on the side. Now again, this force is not a force that's acting directly on the object. It's the overall sum of the forces will result in the centripetal force. So that should bring the question then, what are the as other forces that are acting? Well, the force of gravity is definitely acting on that ball because it has mass. We can calculate the force of gravity is just mass times gravity. Um, and that is pulling down because gravity always pulls down. There is another force though acting on this ball if it's being swung by a string, and that is the tension force, Ft. Notice here the tension force is also pulling down um, because tension can only pull in the direction of the string. A string can only pull, it can never push. Um, so since the string is coming from the, the ball going downward, we draw the tension force going downward as well. What that means is that this tension and this gravity force have to add together to result in this centripetal force, which means just add them up and you'll get centripetal force. Now at the bottom, our picture looks slightly different. Our centripetal force is still towards the center, but now towards the center is up um, because it's at the bottom of the circle. Uh, so centripetal force, I'll just draw that on the outside. It's not a force directly on the object. It's just the overall force that results. Now gravity is still down uh, because the force of gravity always points towards the center of the earth. But now our force of tension has to follow the rope um, and the rope is pulling up. So our force of tension is going to be upward. Now notice something about how I've drawn these vectors. In this case at the bottom, I know that I need to have an overall force of FC pointing up. So overall, when I sum all the forces together, I should end up with a net force pointing upward. And the only way that that can happen is that if the tension force is greater than the force of gravity, uh, which now, if you look at this, you can see very clearly that of course the string is going to break more likely at the bottom than it is at the top, because you have to overcome gravity and then still have a net force that equals a centripetal force. 
I think this is actually easier to see if we put some numbers to it. So let's look at this problem just with some numbers and say, I calculated that for the, the velocity of this particular ball going around, um, the centripetal force required would have to be 20 newtons. Um, and this ball, if I calculate its uh, force of gravity, its weight is five newtons. I wanna find the tension force um, that's acting at the top and at the bottom. So before I do that, let's plug in what I know. I know that the centripetal force overall has to be 20 newtons towards the center of the circle. So at the top, that's 20 newtons down. I know that the gravity is five newtons and that's always pointing down. So we got five newtons down. And now the tension force is all that's remaining. Tension force is going down because tension is always pulling with the string. So now I have a picture here where I've got a five Newton force going down and some other force going down and it has to result in 20 Newtons going down. Now looking at that, it's a pretty clear answer. Like what should the, the tension force be? Well, it's whatever it has to be for it to add up to 20. Um, and that force is 15. So 15 Newtons plus five Newtons will give me that 20 overall centripetal force that I needed. At the bottom, again, my picture looks different. I still have 20 Newtons of centripetal force that's required to make it move in this circle. So overall, I need to have 20 Newtons of force now going up because that's where the center of the circle is. Force of gravity is still down, that's still five Newtons, but now my tension force is going up um, because that's where the rope is. So again, this is the same picture that we drew before, but now it has numbers. If I need an overall force going up as 20 Newtons, what does the tension force have to be to cancel out this five Newtons and still result in a 20 Newton force going up. So you should be able to look at that and say, oh, it's just gotta be the difference. Um, FT minus five has to give you 20. So I end up with 25 Newtons of force uh, pulling upward. Um, so again, you can see 25 Newtons versus 15 Newtons. The string is experiencing more force at the bottom than it is at the top. So let's look at this all the way through. In the last example, I gave you a centripetal force and I gave you a force of gravity, but often you're not gonna be given those things. Instead, you're given things like the mass, the tangential velocity or the linear velocity and the radius of a circle. But from that information, that's enough to actually calculate centripetal force. So we were given it in the last problem, but here we're just gonna calculate it. Centripetal force is mass times velocity squared divided by the radius. The mass is two, the velocity is five, and the radius is 0.5. So I can calculate the centripetal force required to make this motion happen. Um, so two times five squared divided by 0.5 is 100 Newtons. The centripetal force at the top is 100 Newtons. Uh, but assuming that it keeps this same velocity all the way through, at the bottom we have the same conditions that to maintain this velocity, this radius, and this mass, overall I need 100 newtons of centripetal force um, pointing inward. Um, now the net force, as we said before, is equivalent to the centripetal force. So if it's helpful for you to think of net force, they're just the same. Um, you don't have to do this step if you can understand that centripetal force acts like a net force here, uh, just as long as you can see, the, see it in the picture. The force of gravity, we know how to calculate as well if we are given the mass. The mass is two kilograms. Force of gravity is just mass times gravity. The mass is two, gravity is 9.81. That gives you a force of gravity of 19.62. The weight is 19.62 Newtons. Now, up until this point, everything looks exactly the same for the top and the bottom as far as our numbers are concerned. And that was the same in the last problem too, because I gave you the force of gravity and I gave you the centripetal force that was required for this circle. Here is where it differs. It's the tension force. Again, you must look at your free body diagram. You must draw it out. FG is going down. FT at the top is going down because that's where the string is pulling. And FC is going down because that's where the center of the circle is. Now, if all of, if FT and FG have to add up to FC, I can figure out what's, what FT has to be. Basically, FG is 19.62 and FC is 100. So FT has to be whatever um, will add up with 19.62 to get 100, and that is 80.38 Newtons. At the bottom, remember, FG is going down, 
FC is going up and FT is going up. So the overall force has to be 100, but we have this force of gravity pulling down at 19.62. So what would FT have to be for the overall net force or centripetal force to be 100? Just like the last problem, we expect that to be larger than it was at the top, and it comes out to 119.62 newtons because FT has to be 100 newtons larger than FG to result the centripetal force of 100. One last example here, and I want to show you what it looks like for the other equation that's given for net force or centripetal force in circular motion. Um, what is the angular velocity in radians per second at the bottom of a circuit, vertical circle when a 0.2 kilogram phone charger is swung with a 0.8 meter cord and a tension of six newtons at its lowest point? So here, I'm only asking about the lowest point, so I've only drawn in the lowest point. Now, at the lowest point, our centripetal force must be upward because that's where the center of the circle is relative to the object. We can calculate centripetal force using a couple different equations. This is what's provided in your data booklet. But here, what's important is that we are given the angular velocity in radians per second. So we must use the equation that uses angular velocity. And that is the second one, m omega squared r. Um, so ultimately, I want to find, um, uh, what am I looking for? I'm finding the angular velocity. I'm looking for omega which means in order to find omega, I need m, I need r, and I need fc. I know m, m is the mass here, 0.2. I know r, r is the radius, 0.8, but I don't necessarily know fc yet. Um, what I do know is that the, the tension force is going up in the force of gravity, or tension force is six newtons, that's what's provided. And the force of gravity is going down, force of gravity I can calculate, is mass times gravity, or 0.2 times 9.81, which is 1.96 newtons, which means that my centripetal force is just the combination of these two. 6 minus 1.96 is 4.04. .04. That's my centripetal force. Um, again, I was able to find that because I was given the tension at the lowest point. So if I use this equation, plugging 4.04 .04 in for the centripetal force, 0.2 in for the mass, 0.8 in for the radius. I can rearrange and say that omega squared is just 4.04 .04 divided by 0.2 divided by 0.8, which is 25.25. Square root of that is 5.02 radians per second, which means it travels almost once around per second because once around would be 2 pi or 6.28 radians. So in this video, uh, you should come away from this being able to compare the forces of an object at different positions in circular motion. Uh, you should be able to determine the magnitude and direction of the forces needed for an overall centripetal force. So looking at your picture and say, all right, tension is up or tension is down, which way is the centripetal force going and how do these need to interact to result in that? And then qualitative just qualitatively describe how tension changes in a vertical circle. The most common uh, issue that I have with students on the test is that they mix them up and that they make the tension at the top larger than the tension at the bottom. But you should be able to know that tension at the bottom is always going to be larger if you're swinging an object in a circle with a string.